Right. That's good. So just thinking about the class has left me breathless. So let us sing a few songs. <clears throat> um, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father nor my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father or a mother, but it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the elders or the deacons, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the elders or the deacons, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my neighbors are strangers, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my neighbors are strangers, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. If you only knew the table. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> if you only knew the blessing that salvation brings, you would come to the feast today. For the door is open wide and the Savior bids you come. There is nothing you have to pay so be wise and step inside and do not be like those who have thrown their only chance away seek ye first the kingdom of god and he is righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Bring in hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Sing in hallelujah, hallelujah. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, singing Alleluia, 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 singing Alleluia. Hallelujah. And sing one more chorus. Is one more chorus, and then we will have our opening prayer. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
When I go to work, I'm gonna let it shine. When I go to work, I'm gonna let it shine. When I go to work, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. When I'm on the street, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, when I'm on the street, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm on the street, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And when I'm in the church, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm in the church, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm in the church, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now have a word of prayer. Brothers and sisters, please bow with me. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity you've provided us here today. You have torn down so many barriers and obstacles so that we could be here as a family in Christ. We truly appreciate the time you've provided us and we ask, Lord, you'd open our minds and our hearts to be prepared to receive the lesson that's here today, that we'd find ways to apply it in our lives and that we would behave in a manner that would be even more Christ-like because of it. We thank you so much, Lord, for the, the wonderful gifts that you've given us. And we ask, Lord, that you would, we humbly ask, Lord, that you would continue to do so. I ask that you be with Stephen as he gives this lesson, that you would give him a recollection of what he's prepared, that he'd be able to deliver it in an effective manner. And I ask you, Lord, that you be with this congregation to help us grow, to help us improve, and help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you very much, Brother Jason. Thank you very much, Brother Smith, for bailing me out. Um, and good evening to everyone else. Um, I hope that we have had a wonderful day. And even if it hasn't been the most wonderful day, I'm praying that it will take a turn for the better starting now. Um, another privileged opportunity for us to, to join together and to study God's word. Um, it's been a really enjoyable time for me. It has allowed studying the Bible um, to, I don't want to say to take, be more routine, but to be more disciplined, um, having Having no choice but to ensure that I go through the material before I teach it has at least um, reinforced the importance of, of studying on a consistent basis. And the classes have made it very easy to, to, to take on or to undergo that practice. So I really want to thank you guys for helping me to grow in that regard. And I'm hoping that what we have been going through has helped you at least even marginally to to grow closer to Christ. The study, as per usual, last a case study, Luke chapter 15 is the source of our study, and the focus of our study is based on the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. And we have been looking at the lost sheep for quite some time, and the intention of our study is to surmise why the sheep ended up lost, because the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, to identify if we could get lost in similar ways, and then how to remedy if we have been lost in a similar fashion, or to ensure that we will not get lost in that similar fashion. And we've been looking at the past few weeks at what we've described as climber's condition, and this is 
um, when correlated, a circumstance where disturbances, whether personal disturbances that we are dealing with, whether interpersonal disturbances that occur between us and our brothers in Christ, or external disturbances that occur outside of the body, have led us to feel as though we need to withdraw ourselves, to move away. It may be, it may be in our heads a temporary withdrawal, like, okay, I need to get away to get my head straight for a few days or weeks. It may be a longer withdrawal where you feel like, you know what? This is not the place for me. Can't deal with that person. Can't deal with this environment. It may be a, per, a permanent withdrawal from Christ where you're like, okay, this Christianity thing not working out. And that's, that's just it. And even if it isn't to the extremes as described, I'm sure we can all um, correlate to having gone through something, whether personally or become so infuriated with an individual or a group of individuals that we're just like, boy, if you are what being a part of this body means I have to cope with or deal with, better I'm going to deal with this set of people. And the point of what we've been looking at thus far is how to deal with these circumstances, deal with these disturbances without that withdrawal, without that isolation, ensuring that we don't compromise our relationship with God. And we looked at three types of of support that we, we, we suggested could help dealing with our disturbances. The first one was scriptural support. Um, looking to scripture to find the encouragement that is needed in, in dealing with these disturbances. We looked at sibling support, finding individuals in the body to help us to go through our hard times, to get assistance from <clears throat> when we're struggling, and then we looked at um, support systems, which is the idea of the church based on how it is founded, providing support to its members. So this goes out of just now the individual responsibility that we have as Christians and goes more to the responsibilities that we have as a church to one another, to ensuring that we provide the support to our members and by extension, to anyone who comes in contact with the church. <clears throat> and we're looking at Hebrews chapter 10 to put a nice little ribbon on, on all of these things that we have been looking at when it comes on to dealing with disturbances or climate condition for a better word. And Hebrews, we looked at, we read on Sunday from verse 1 through to verse 25. <clears throat> And since, um, since I'm going to be referencing a lot of the passage thus far, and for those who may not have been there on Sunday, just going to ask if I can get some readers once more so we can just read through this before we start. <coughs> All right, so thank you. So we have Lacon family, we have Sister Paula. Need three more hands, three. Kirk, thank you. Two more readers. <coughs> All right, Britannia and Sister Smith, thank you. All right, so Brother Jason or Lacan, whoever from the Lacan family are in yellow. Sister Paula, you're green. Kirk, you're blue. Britt, you're orange. And Sister Smith, you are pink. You can start us off, Brother Jason. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, 
you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burn offerings and offerings for sin. You did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. O God, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that, we have been satisfied through this. Sorry, sorry. By that, we have been satisfied, satisfied, satisfied through the satisfied. offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made put stool. For by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who have been sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, can switch, Stephen. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sin and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is a remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for excellent reading um brother jason brother kirk sister britannia sister smith and sister paula so yes so on sunday we did essentially an explanation of verse 1 through to verse 25 and we showed how the verses that were read were essentially making a comparison we were making a comparison between the old covenant, which was an agreement between God and the Israelites, and the new covenant, which is the agreement with, between God and us individuals living now, anyone who lived after Jesus' death. And the old covenant had an arrangement for, for dealing with sin, sin being a violation of God's law. So when God established the old covenant with the Israelites. He gave them a set of laws. And one of the, the, one of the um, requirements of this covenant was for the Israelites to, fulfill, to carry out these laws, to do what God is telling them to do. And if they do that, the other side of the covenant is what God would do in return. And while some of these laws the breaking of them would lead to instant death. There are a lot of laws that there would just be relative punishments um, that were of a lighter nature. But all of the violations of these laws would have been sin because they would have been going against God's commands or instructions. And we know 
from a scriptural perspective that a penalty for sin must be paid. At the time, the arrangement for the covering of that penalty was through the sacrificing of the blood of animals. So blood is a requirement. The animal blood was a requirement for the children of Israel to not be punished by God for the sins that they had committed. And the process through which this occurred was that on, for one day of the year, there would be a sacrifice made on behalf of all the people for the sin that would have been committed through that, throughout that year. The high priest would go into the tabernacle. He would go into a particular location of the tabernacle, tabernacle called the holiest or the holy of holies. In that location, the spirit of God would actually be present and the sacrifice for sin would be made. What we learn from the scripture is what this sacrifice did was essentially cover sin. So it would cover the sins of the Israelites. It would not remove it. There would still be a remembrance of sin. There would still be a conscience towards sin. And what this passage is showing is that Jesus Christ, in his death, he took on the role of both the sacrifice and the high priest. He interceded on our behalf to present the sacrifice to God. And his blood was the sacrifice. And what we found in these scriptures is that unlike the blood of bulls and goats and sheep that could only cover sin, the blood of Jesus, due to his innocence, due to his, it being free from sin, provided complete removal of sin and the necessity of sacrifice. So having died, Jesus' sacrifice played the role that made no further sacrifice necessary. So we as individuals now, we as Christians now, have no need to offer any sacrifice for sin because Jesus' sacrifice covered that role. And we started looking at the implications of this information. So now having found out all of this, the writer of Hebrew wanted us to behave in a particular manner. And there are some there are some instructions that he gives to us as Christians, some encouragement that he uses to, to inspire our behavior. And that is what we want to look at. We looked at some of these already. So the first one he said was having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And we had said on Sunday that this boldness, this confidence, this assurance um, is significant because back in the Old Testament days, the holiest was a place that only the high priest could enter once a year. And it had to be to offer the blood sacrifice. That was how um, privileged the location this was, the actual presence of God. And the writer is saying that because of all of Jesus' sacrifice and what it means, because of this blood of Jesus, we have the confidence to enter into the place where the spirit of God is. He said, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. And we, we recognize when we were looking at this, that the new literally means um, recently slain, recently slain. And it speaks to the fact that this way, the reason it has come into existence was because of Jesus' death. So this way that gives us life came because Jesus died. And in that dying, he introduced this path to us. So the fact that we can approach with confidence the Spirit of God, that avenue 
was created through Jesus' death. And it's further emphasized in the idea of through the veil. And we look, we recognize that the veil here is literally speaking to the separation, the curtains that separated the holiest in the tabernacle from the regular holy place. So there are two veils. One of the veils separated the holiest, where the spirit of God would be, where the sacrifice of blood would be made, from the holy place. And then another veil would separate the holy place from the outer court of the temple. And through Jesus' death, that veil, that veil that would have separated regular individuals from the holiest place and the holy place, we now have access to it through the veil, um, through Jesus' flesh, sorry. And flesh can mean the meat of an animal as food, the body, or human nature. And in this case, it is specifically speaking to the body, Jesus' body. So, and the, of course, the likening of Jesus' body speaks to the church. We, we know in several scriptures, we see where Jesus the, is the head of the church and we are his body. So the avenue that was created, this new path that was created with Jesus' death, that gives us access to God, the spirit of God, is Jesus' flesh. And the flesh here means his body, and Jesus' body is the church. So the new thing that Jesus created with his death, and this is validated in numerous scriptures, is the church. This church that he created with his death gives us a new path, and it gives us access to God. And having a high priest over the house of God. So this is where... We stopped on Sunday. Um, I hope that those who may not have been there don't feel lost now. Um, if there are any questions or queries, feel free to ask now. If not, then we will pick up from where we left off. All right, no questions. All right, so let's go. And it says, and having a high priest over the house of God. Once again, a reference is being made to how things were done in the old, under the old covenant, where the high priest in the literal house of God was the one who would be responsible for sacrificing on behalf of the people. And what this passage is saying is that Jesus has taken on this responsibility. Jesus is now the high priest that we have over the house of God. And what does that mean? What is the implication there? It means that we if we have Jesus, we have the access to God. We don't need somebody through which to access God. We don't need somebody through outside of Jesus, of course, through which to access forgiveness. We don't need someone to make sacrifices on our behalf because the, the very Jesus who threw the veil, which is his flesh, created a new path, is the same Jesus who is our high priest over the house of God. Word high priest, literally the word high means big. The word priest means a priest. And when the words are used together, it is specific to the individual who you, at the time, from the house of or from the lineage of Levi, um, from the house of Jacob, those were the individuals who from that 
specific bloodline would end up being the high priest who would be in charge of the, tab the tabernacle. And Jesus is this high priest. Word house means a dwelling by implication a family and God being the supreme divinity. So the, the family, this can literally be translated to the high priest over the family of God. And once again, that's a reinforcement of the idea that Jesus' death is what created the, the church, where his flesh, his body, is what is the new path that has been created for us. And that is important because of what will be coming next. So when we look through the rest of Hebrews, this establishment, the importance of highlighting to the readers that Jesus' death created this body for, for individuals who would follow him afterwards is an important foundation for the things that he's going to encourage them to do later on. And if it's something that we don't take with extreme significance, then sometimes the message that is being brought forward afterwards will not be taken as seriously as we should take it. So let's see what is said after. So it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The word draw near, it means to approach. And in a literal sense, it means to come near or to visit. So to come near or to visit is the literal, literal term. And the idea behind it is to approach, go in the direction of to approach. And this is another. So the first, the first encouragement that was given is to boldly enter the holiest through the blood of Jesus. And that was as a result of the confidence that comes from the fact that Jesus died and created this avenue. The next thing that the Hebrew writer tells us is to draw near, to draw near, to approach. And he says that we should draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So our drawing near or approaching should be done in two ways. One, with a true heart. And two, in full assurance of faith. What, what is he telling us now? What does this mean? What is this saying? Let's look at the words and see if we can get some understanding of what the Hebrew writer wants us or how the Hebrew writer is telling us to draw near. Please note, figuratively speaking, it means worship. So a lot of the draw near, um, we have a lot of songs that use the terminology draw near and it is literally in the use of worship. The word true means truthful or true. Gives the idea of honest, of having no, no falsehood. Um, it says that which is not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name. So that which is not only the name and resemblance. So. For example, if I tell you that um, I have a, a particular brand of, let's say a handbag, I'm, I'm selling you a handbag and you want a Prada handbag or you want a Gucci handbag. True in this sense, in this, if it's a true Gucci handbag, it wouldn't just be a Gucci handbag that has the name Gucci or looks like Gucci. So you might find a brand that look like Gucci, but when you look close, you see it's Gucci. And you say, boy, it resembles Gucci, but it's not really Gucci. Or you might find a bag that has the name Gucci on it, 
but it isn't made from by Gucci. So I decided to make a bag and put the name Gucci on it. So it has the same name, but it wasn't made by Gucci. Or it may look like it is the actual brand, but it's only in resemblance. It's not actually Gucci. When we think of this true, it means that in its nature, it corresponds to its name. So once you see the name, you know that the nature aligns itself with whatever that name implies. So you hear Nike, you know that it was made from this particular brand. You hear Toyota, you're not going to, you're not going to be a Nissan. You're not going to be a Prado. There is an alignment between name and nature. That is the kind of true there. No falsehood, no deception, no facade. What you hear or what you see is what it is in actuality. And that is the kind of heart that we are told to draw near with. And in heart, it speaks to thoughts or feelings, thoughts or feelings. So having true thoughts, having true, the feelings that we have being true, no falsehoods, no um, ulterior motives. That is the kind of heart that we are told to draw near with. Not drawing near because we think that that is what we should do and we want people to see us doing it so them don't say that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. That wouldn't be true. Not drawing near because my friend is drawing near and I don't want to look like the only person not drawing near. There needs to be an alignment in truth with our thoughts and our feelings and the actions that follow. So real nature corresponding to the name, not just name only or resemblance only. And it's it's a very, a lot of, um, a lot of ill is spoken of the church because of this ideology. The idea that our actions, both in regards to of our worship and the name that we wear as Christians, our nature doesn't correspond to it. So a lot of the times people will say that we only have the name or we only resemble the name that we claim to wear. And we have, if we want to have the kind of influence that the Bible or that God would want us to have, this is an ex extremely important position from which to start. Working on a true heart, ensuring that us drawing near to God, that our attempt to be the people God wants us to be is coming from a place of truth. That the actions that I am carrying out are my, the real nature of what I should be carrying out and not something that is done in pretense, not something that is done to create this image that I think people think. Um, want to see of me or need to see of me. True heart, the first condition that is established by, by the Hebrew writer. And then the next thing that he says is in full assurance of faith. So drawing near with a true heart, that is one condition, and then in full assurance of faith is the next condition. The word full assurance means entire confidence entire confidence essentially think of a hundred percent surety a hundred percent conviction there is no doubt there is no questioning there is no maybe this won't be the case entire confidence wholehearted belief this is going to be the case um, when i was in high school I had a math teacher that I had entire confidence that if there is no cancellation of school, he was going to be in class and early. 
There was no doubt, there was no wavering. At no point in my life would I go to school on that day. No, I have much and even hold a half belief that he was not going to be there. Entirety of my being was convicted and he always came to class. He's the worst math teacher, but if you can, one thing I can give him was attendance. 100% full assurance. That is the type of faith with which we need to draw near. And we know what faith is. Persuasion, credence, moral conviction, our belief and the firmness of it. And that is, I think these two, these two, um, Conditions, I think, sum up, sum up the foundation of our Christianity um, very well. Um, what our motives and our beliefs. Why are we doing the things that we are doing? And what belief is driving those actions? And a lot of the times you find a parallel between the two. If our faith is not where it should be, it is very easy for our actions to be misaligned. Where if I don't really believe, you know, there's no, I mean, it might be right, but there's no wholehearted conviction that, yeah, this is what I should be doing. And it's very easy for me to start wavering in, in the why of what I am doing or in the, am I carrying it out for the right reasons? So, Working on the true heart is important, but working on the true heart will be difficult if our, the confidence of our, of our belief, of our, how persuaded we are that this is the right thing is lacking. If I am not sure, if I am not convicted, if I don't believe that the way, the, the cause for which I live is sure, then it's going to be very difficult for me to stand true to that name. Because do I really believe it? Am I really convinced that this is it? So the, the writer recognizes that for, for us to achieve the things that he's going to ask us to achieve, this is the foundation point. Our drawing near, our worship to God, our approaching God. Remember, this is on the, on the ground that we are entering the place where God's spirit is. We, our intention is to commune and interact with God and one another in this body that Christ has created for us. For us to properly approach, for us to properly approach, for us to go to the place that we need to be, we need a true heart, and we need full assurance. Any questions, any comments before I move on? Everybody following, I hope, in spite of my talkativeness. Okay, um, I'm going to take the silence as consent. Moving on. Having our hearts, oh, something in the chat. Let me see what it is. Uh, Kirk says, oh, wow, Kirk, a long time I put this in the chat. My apologies. The concept of Jesus' sacrifice being eternally sufficient is a stumbling block for man. Attended a few churches in the past that believe that Christians should still carry out these feast days. Well, Kirk, um, I think that's, there are a lot of traditions and beliefs that in the, in the carrying out of them, call into question the actions that have been made on our behalf. And I think sometimes our understanding of why these things are no longer required would help us to recognize that they are no longer required. But rather than coming to that understanding, individuals don't necessarily look 
into the why it was carried out in the first place and the implication for us spiritually if they still need to be carried out. So that's one of the reasons why as Christians, we have a responsibility to study. We have a responsibility to ensure that um, we look through scriptures and use it as our support for our behavior. Because if we are doing things and we can't find the support in scripture to justify those actions, then we're in problem. Especially if we're telling others what it is they should be doing and we don't have any support to validate those kinds of instructions. So one of the intentions of Bible class is for us to look in scripture and see if we can understand what it is that we're supposed to do based on the scripture and what it is that we shouldn't. So good, good comment, Kirk. Um, Stephen? Oh, somebody want to talk? Kirk. Oh, go ahead, Kirk. No, just a follow up on, on that as well. Um, as much as persons go off, you know, because of um, misunderstanding, I think also that it may be a, a warning for, for those who, who, who try and do, to follow. Because um, I think, especially for me, it's, uh, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a stretch to grasp that um, the grasp the whole concept that accepting Christ uh, and, and, and obedience to him is all that is necessary. You feel like you need to add something, you need to do something, you need to um, earn your keep, so to speak. And, and um, ever so often we need teaching like this to, well, for me, I need teaching like this to refresh my memory to say, listen, Jesus has done it all um, as it pertains to, to um, being you know, saved, sanctified, etc. And, and it, what I need is acceptance and obedience um, to, to, to the dictates that he has put forward. So I think it's sometimes is a, is a warning um, just to make sure that we, we stick to what is written and not um, go off. Excellent point. Excellent point, Kirk. Um, we can't say it better than the Bible. So if you can't say it with the Bible, my recommendation is always to keep silent. So, okay, he says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So when I read this the first time, I was like, whoa, what, what that mean? Is it, is it how it looks? Anybody can, can give me an idea as to what you think this, this, past, this verse right here is saying. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Anybody want to brave, bravely tell me what, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you read that? Or what, what idea comes to mind or what image having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience? You know, no wrong answers, so feel free to, to try. All right, go ahead, Sister Smith. Just not feeling guilty anymore, freedom from that sense of guilt. Okay, okay. Freedom from that sense of guilt, not, not a bad answer at all. Any, any, um, any other suggestions? Or we, we're all in agreement with this assessment. All right, um, let's get into it then. Let's see if breaking down the words can help us to get an understanding. So heart, um, figuratively speaking, thoughts or feelings, same word that was used in the, the previous verse, sprinkled. So the word sprinkled means to render besprinkled or besprinkled. To render besprinkled, i.e. to asperse ceremonially or figuratively. So um, a lot of well, I'm not sure for the um, vocabulary aficionados in the in the class. These may be they may not be new words to you, but I didn't know. So, for example, besprinkled. I never knew that that was actually a word. I did know asperse, 
which only one side of the definition. So the word besprinkled or to besprinkle, which is a verb, <laughs> is to sprinkle all over with small drops or amounts of a substance. So when I read that, I was like, isn't that the same definition as sprinkle? Was there really need for a new word, be sprinkle, which means to sprinkle? Because as far as I'm concerned, when you sprinkle, it's always with small drops or amounts of a substance. So as far as I was concerned, be sprinkle is literally to sprinkle. The word asperse, however, lends a little more context to the type of sprinkling that is taking place. So the word asperse means to sprinkle, but especially to sprinkle with holy water. Especially to sprinkle with holy water. So the idea that comes from aspersion is the idea of purification. So you sprinkle holy water on something to purify it, to make it holy. And that is what is being brought out here. So when, you're ha when it says having your heart sprinkled, it doesn't speak, it, when you're reading this in an English sense, it doesn't, it isn't telling you what it is sprinkled with. But when you look into the Greek, it is giving you the idea that what the heart is being sprinkled with is some purifi purifying agent, something that purifies. So essentially, it could be, you could um, substitute the verb sprinkled here with purified. So having our hearts purified from an evil conscience. Evil. In the Greek, there are three words that are used throughout the Greek that are um, synonyms of evil. So when you're reading, you might see evil in your Bible, and it may be one of three Greek words that are used. The other two Greek words, kekos and sapros, one of them means evil in nature, meaning that it is naturally evil. So it, it would probably be used in reference to poison, probably used in reference to demons or demonic things, probably used in reference to sin. So anything evil in nature, in the essence of itself. Sapros, evil by corruption. So something turning into evil because of some other reason. So it never start out evil, but now it is evil because it has been corrupted. But the evil that is used here speaks to evil in its effect or influence. Evil because of what it does. Evil because of how it, how it carries out consequences. So it causes harm. That is the evil that is established here. So it may not be evil in nature. It may not have been corrupted. But what it causes to you is harm. And as a result, it is evil. So when you read evil conscience, in a normal sense, you might think, oh my gosh, that is the devil on your shoulder. That is the, the whispers that are saying, oh, do this bad thing, do this bad thing. But that is not the evil that is being established here. The evil essentially is something that causes you harm, something that causes you hurt. That is the kind of evil that we're looking at here. And the word conscience means co-perception or moral consciousness. And that the word co-perception, meaning co-meaning joint, and perception meaning the way something is understood or interpreted. And it literally speaks to the idea of the conscience. If we jump back, if we jump back to, let me find it, Ooh, jump, 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 jump. Maybe this wasn't the fastest way to do things. But I want to, I want to highlight what Sister Smith brought up, which is exactly what this passage is saying. If you notice in verse 2, it says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers 
once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. If we align that with the verse that we just read, that says, having our heart sprinkled and the sprinkled there meaning purified, we would be what? Um, purified of what? An evil conscience. That conscience there, that evil conscience, the harm that is done to us is literally the consciousness of sins. The knowledge that it has not been properly washed away. The guilt that comes from this overbearing sin that is on our shoulders. The consequences of which are still remaining because blood and goats, the blood of goats and bulls can remove. What we are seeing in verse 21 is that this purification that comes through Jesus' death through the blood of Jesus, removes this evil conscience, removes this reminder of sin, removes the guilt that comes with the knowledge that our consequences for sin are still hovering over us, reminding us that, boy, what the, the measures that you're taking have not really um, removed the consequences. So once again, the writer pulling from the earlier verses to help us to understand the verses that follow. Somebody needs to teach me how to use PowerPoint so that I can find go through these things faster. All right. Oh, so that is where we, we stopped. Um, I hope that, that 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 wasn't complicated. Anybody lost? Everybody with me? Somebody say I we need to hear somebody. I talk for too long. Anybody say aye? Aye, aye, aye. All right, wonderful. And uh, Unana lost. Somebody said no? Or yes, I mean, because if you lost, then you should tell me. Following, I'm following Stephen. All right, wonderful. From Faye and so that you know that it's true. <laughs> All right, so our hearts, this, this, um, this conscience or consciousness of sin, has been removed by the death of Jesus. So we no longer have that to worry about, that the fact that sin is still looming over us. And then he says, and our bodies washed with pure water. Body, literally meaning the body. And the word washed here, meaning to bathe the whole person, to bathe the whole person. So this is different from this word here. So there's the word nikto, which means to cleanse a part of the body, especially the hands or the feet or the face, the face, and it different from the word plino, which means to wash with reference to clothing. So this wash here speaks to the, the washing of the entire body. And I found that interesting for two reasons. One, this kind of bodily purification was a requirement for the high priest. So in a lot of places, the cleansing of a body part was a sufficient requirement for worship, for approaching, for drawing near. Once you wash your hands or your feet or your face, then you are now deemed to be in a good standing to worship. But the drawing near that is, is being established here requires not that kind of um, half wash or specific washing, but an entire washing of the body. Found it interesting for two reasons. One, the direct parallel to the high priest, that if our bodies have been washed in a similar nature to the high priest, this is a reference to the fact that we have the allowance to enter the place that the high priest can enter. Just as he could go in there and had to wash himself, we have been washed to allow us to enter. And then also I found a very interesting parallel to baptism. The idea that baptism requires the entire person to be submerged and baptism is what 
adds us to the church, found it very interesting that the same washing of our bodies is aligned in a scripture where the verse that preceded it spoke to the fact that the very thing that leads to us getting this wash is the thing that establishes the church. So Jesus' death, Jesus' blood that washes us with pure water is the very thing that establishes the church that we are now a part of. So I found that the use of language there to be very, very, um, very interesting in how it aligns with the message that is brought up. And not just washed with anything, of course. It says washed, washed with pure water. The word pure, meaning clean, and the word water, meaning literally water. And we know that water carries um, significant weight in regards to what it represents. So in a, water as a symbol, water that we use may not carry the weight, but it has very symbolic nature to us as Christians when it speaks to baptism and it, its representation as a burial. Stephen? Yes, go ahead, sister. And uh, yes, good evening. Um, as you spoke about the, the word nipto, meaning to cleanse a part of the body, I found it interesting um, in terms of this washing because the Muslims, for instance, they practice what they call ablution. I don't know if it's the same word that they use as we use it. I think the Catholics also use ablution too, but they call it ablution and they wash their feet and their hands and their face because they, they say they wouldn't be clean enough, enough to go and do their prayers. prayers. So they don't do a whole body wash. They just do their, their, their feet. So they have to go into their mosque with, with clean feet and they leave their shoes outside. So I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if this came from, you know, the, from that particular practice and they still do that kind of thing in, in their Islamic religion. Okay, um, excellent point. I know, I know that it, they are also, it's also a Jewish practice. Um, in certain, depending on, on what the feast day was, that type of, of washing would take place as well, where it would be specific to hands, feet, and, and face. But as I said, um, I found it, given that the full body washing is a requirement for the high priest in his entrance, I found that that correlation was very powerful in highlighting what we have been given as a result of Jesus' death. Because this, this passage is not saying that we should wash, you know. This passage is saying that we have been washed, that this is something that has taken place because of our interaction and our relationship with Christ. That washing is automatic. It's not something that we have to do after we have, been, um, have become Christians. It is something that we get that privilege um, is given to us. We don't have to wash our bodies not every time we want to talk to God because through Jesus' death, we have been washed. So very, very powerful, um, very important. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. This is a passage that we looked at when we were looking at um, Bark Bug. And we were talking about the foundation of the foundation of our confidence in God. And it was it was twofold that God, God will give us what God keeps his promises, and that God is powerful enough to carry out his promises. So we looked at this verse in um, in depth there. So we're going to look at it again here. So hold to hold fast means to hold down to hold down, keep secure, keep firm possession of. So it, it gives the idea of you putting your body weight on something to ensure that it will not leave you. Imagine you're trying to catch, you catch a, a, a dog or, or some animal that's trying to run away and you're holding it down to keep it firm. Or you, 
Uh, I know I use the fighting metaphor less, less people say me I give ideas in here, so let's stick with that. You're holding down something, it's, you're keeping it secure, you're keeping it firm. You don't want to lose it. You want to make sure that it stays. You're putting out all the effort to ensure that you keep whatever this thing is. That is the idea that comes from hold fast. There's an intense desire that is leading you to action to ensure that this thing will not leave you. This thing will not be lost. And what is this thing that we are supposed to hold fast? The confession of our hope without wavering. Confession of our hope without wavering. So the confession here firstly meaning an acknowledgement, literally a statement saying that this is so. That is the confession. This is so. This is what it is. This is the case. And the confession of our hope, a profession, sorry, a confession, a profession, or a confession. And our hope, hope here means to anticipate usually with pleasure, an expectation or a confidence. So the acknowledgement, the profession, the confession of what it is that we are anticipating, what is our expectation, what is our confidence. And naturally as Christians, well, let me not say naturally, this is something that as Christians we need to have an answer for. A lot of the times we look we, we, we're in the faith, but we, we, we don't wholeheartedly know why. So when you read passages like this that say, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, if it, what runs in our head when we think of the confession of our hope is some blase, ill-defined, ambiguous feeling, then how can we hold it fast to it? How can we not waver if the very definition of, the, of our hope is uncertain? We need, you need, and I need to know what do I, what am I anticipating? What is my expectation as a Christian? The life that I am living, what do I expect to get from it? What am I confident in? that is reinforcing the decisions that I make. When I say I am a Christian, what does that mean for, for the rest of my life? If you don't have a full, firm, solid answer that you can use, that you can say, that you can acknowledge, that you can profess and say, this is it. This is my hope. This is my expectation. Then how can you hold fast to that? How can you keep secure what you're not certain of? How can you not waver when you're not even sure the direction that you're going in? If there is uncertainty now, this should be the first thing that we attempt to find out. What is it that I am expecting of this life that I am living in Christ? And if I am not in Christ, then what are my expectations? And can I get them outside of Christ? Because that is where the rest of this passage goes. The reason we should hold fast, the reason we should hold fast and without wavering, and the idea be behind the word without wavering means not leaning, firm, unmoved. There is no need to rest on something else. I'm not, I'm not bending to one side or the other. Firm. The reason we can do this, the reason this is okay, is because he who promised is faithful. And the word for here means the reason that or on this ground. So this literally is telling us that the ground for holding fast without wavering the reason we can hold fast without wavering is what follows the four. And that is he who promised is faithful. The word promised means to announce upon, assert something respecting oneself. So, the, so God 
being the one who has asserted something respecting himself or has announced his or to promise to engage voluntarily is faithful and faithful here meaning that they are trustworthy god who promises can be held to his promise you don't have to worry that the promises of god will not come to pass and that is the reason that is the ground upon which we can hold fast to this expectation without wavering. But how, how can I, if I don't know what he asserts of respecting himself? So if I don't know what God is saying he will do, if I don't know what God is announcing, if I don't know what it is that God is promising me, how can I hold fast? And a lot of the times, the, the wavering that takes place comes from our ignorance of God's word. And that makes sense. It's, it's like a politician. If a politician, I know, I, I know that a lot of people, for example, were when Obama became the first um, black president, there are a lot of people in Jamaica who were rejoicing. Um, rejoicing of the idea that um, we have reached a point where skin color would not um, hinder the individual from becoming the president. And that's wonderful. The idea that someone, given what things were like, that's a, a wonderful undertaking. But every time I asked the Jamaican why they, were, um, why they were happy in regards to his policies, or what did they think would make Obama a good president, they couldn't answer me. Why? They had no idea what his policies were. They had no idea what his promises were. They had no idea what he said he was going to be bringing into fruition. So it was literally and a sad statement because of the color of his skin. And that, that is not necessarily the best grounds to be starting from. But the idea is, to, if for individuals who are following politicians from a just position to to hold fast without wavering to the promises of these people, they have to know what the promises are and they have to believe those promises. If them tell me, say, boy, if I'm sure if a politician said today in Jamaica, say, oh, the internet flow and digital, internet will get good and taxes will drop and curfew will lift tomorrow, a lot of individuals would rejoice if they believe that these things are going to come to fruition. If they don't believe, then it will hold no weight to them. Let me say there's another politician that I talk. We need to firstly know what God is promising us, and we need to believe that he will carry out those promises. Once we establish those two things, the holding fast of our confession will become a lot easier. Um, Kirk, I see your hand go ahead. Oh, you gone? You gone? Change your mind or accident? Oh, oh, okay, accident. All right, Kirk says in the group, or faith takes conscious and deliberate effort. Anything that can grow and mature needs attention so that it grows in the direction intended. Amen, bro. Amen to you, Kirk, for that comment. That's excellent. That's an excellent comment. Password? Go ahead, Sister Smith. There are two of them. Which one do you want? One is holiest. And there's another. I'll take I'll just take that one for now. Seeing as I don't have enough time to properly gauge the, the second one. Um Sister Smith, yeah, discourage people from raising their man, you know. I waited, you know, Stephen. <laughs> brother Jason, brother Jason, this book as well, so it wouldn't matter. Um, I know that I, 
I did a lot of rambling today. I hope that you guys will will forgive me. Um, we are, I think there's just two more verses in and what we're going to be doing, I know that we have been, it's been since October, since we started this study and we've, we've covered some ground. Even the most diligent of students and teachers forget things as they go along. So we're going to, depending on how quickly we cover the rest of these verses on Sunday, we're going to do a relatively comprehensive revision, um, at least to, to bring those who have been in the struggle from the beginning up to um, back to scratch and those who may not have started at the beginning um, to, to get an idea of where we started from. After that, we will start a new condition that I think will be very interesting. So we can look forward to that. Um, the password for Sunday is let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. I think this is the longest password that I've given, but it's about time. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Um, thank you very much once again. I hope that we learned something this evening and looking forward to class on Sunday. All right. If we're going to have the closing prayer now, so if you have any prayer requests that you want to share, anything you want us to pray on your behalf, feel free to either raise your hand and say it directly now, or you can type it in the chat. I think. Good night, everyone. Brother Stephen, thanks. Um, I must say, I mean, particularly close to the end, I mean, you've, you've really um, landed some serious questions for us to ponder on. So thank you very much um, for leading today's study again. Um, at this time, we are about to, before we close, we'd like to close in a word of prayer. Are there any prayer requests at this time? Any prayer requests? I'm seeing one from Philip. Oh, um, okay, one second. Oh, I'm not sure if it's a prayer request or if it's a comment. Okay. All right, so I have Lydia. All right, um, if those are all the purpose, I invite you to both me at this time. Our Lord and Father, we approach your Father, your throne of grace at this time. We come before your Father, acknowledging our weaknesses, acknowledging our our dependence on you. Acknowledging the dependence that we have on your son, his blood that continues to cleanse us from our sins. We recognize, O oh God, that even as we walk, O oh Father, this life, we pray, Father, that you will help us just to be mindful of our frailty. Be mindful, O oh Father, of the state that we were in before we entered Christ in baptism. We ask, oh God, that you will be with us at this time, that you will cleanse us from our sins. 
even though, Father, as we continue to look to you for our strength and sustenance, we give you thanks, O oh God, for this evening's Bible class. We just pray, oh Father, you will help us to bear the things studied in mind, even, O oh Father, as we reflect on our, our own lives, our own Christianity, that, O oh Father, we may show ourselves approved unto you, even, O oh Father, as we study your words, that we may rightly divide your words of truth. And at no point, O oh Father, we will believe that we have arrived, but we will continuously seek, O oh Father, to improve our knowledge of you through your scriptures and seek, O oh Father, ways in which, O oh Father, we can be better people before you. Again, we give you thanks, O oh God, for Brother Stephen, for his diligence in studying your words so that he can impart it on us. We give you thanks, O oh God, for everyone in our Bible session this evening, both members and visitors alike. We humbly ask, O oh God, for your blessing on all of us, O oh Father. I took the time to be in this session this evening. At this time, O oh God, we put before you petitions and we ask, O oh God, that you will hear us and grant us the request of our hearts. We put before you a Grinnell as he asks for prayer, prayer, Father, for his physical and spiritual health. Um, he says that he's feeling really down. We pray, Father, that you will be with him and that you will help also, Father, to be a source of support for him, even though, Father, as he manages several responsibilities in his life. We ask, oh, Father, that you will continuously bless him, that he will be reminded, oh, Father, of the fact, oh, Father, that never will you leave nor forsake those that you hold dear. We put before your godly dear, Philippa, she continues to say, she gives thanks, oh God, for the fact that her father's health is improving. Even though, Father, this time as she continues to ask her prayers for him, you know his situation, oh Father, we just ask, oh God, that you will be with him that he will be restored to his natural health. These, O oh Father, are the petitions that have been worded. We, again, just give you thanks, O oh God, for this time that we can be alive, to be here, to be a part of this Bible class. We pray, Father, that you will help us not to take our lives for granted. Even these moments, oh Father, that we can congregate in this fashion. Because we understand, oh Father, that many have not the opportunities that we have, whether through persecution or they, oh Father, have transitioned to the afterlife. We ask, oh Father, that you will help us to make each day count and that we will be a proper representation of you and what you would have of us as members of your church. Again, oh God, we just thank you for your blessings, for your love that you poured out on us on Calvary's cross. And we ask, oh Father, that you will continue to bless us even as we say thanks in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, we'd like to just say thanks to Brother Stephen for, again, leaving, leading a very um, insightful Bible class. I see Sister Smith, I see his hand still up. You're early for next, next Bible class. That's correct. <laughs> All right. All right, so moving on to our announcements. So the session on Sunday um, would have been the last one in terms of the 
um, the Buff Bay Church of Christ. I hope everyone uh, most been able to be a part of that. Um, I believe Brother Andre had presented and they had a, a, a quite a few interesting speakers about godly families, um, especially in this 21st century. So coming up, we have the Old Harbor Church of Christ. Um, I see a note here that the date was changed. So I suspect this is the new date, which is a Bible study series starts May 31st to June 3rd at 7 p.m. Man's Problem and God's Solution. Um, and of course, the popular brother Eddie Fisher uh, will be presenting on that series. So that's May 31st to June 3rd. So it should be going on um, today, the first up to this th coming Thursday. Um, our Navigating Life series continues this coming Saturday. The flyers are readily available, so please share them with your family, friends. And our topic for this Saturday at 6.30 is Managing Emotion Strategies for Peaceful Living. And of course, we have Brother Alan Casey and Brother Smith that will be leading um, the sessions. Um, just a note as well, or just a reminder that all the sessions are recorded and they can be found on the um, church website, standandrewchurchofchrist.org, or um, our Facebook or YouTube channel, Simply Christians JA. Um, so all the recordings are on the website or on the church social media page. Uh, so the birthdays we have for this week is Sister Kim, Brother Grinnell, Sister Grinnell, um, so Sister Kim and Brother Grinnell would be June 3rd. Sister Grinnell would be on June 4th, which is Friday. So um, bear those in mind so that we can reach out to these brethren and wish them all the best for their birthdays. Um, there is, no, I don't see any anniversaries for this week. And um, I think those are all the announcements. Um, that I have at this time. Um, I see there was some recent um, new, well, with the curfews, etc. I think they had extended it. So we are still on the lockdown for the regular days and weekends. So bear that in mind as well. Um, if those are all the announcements I have at this time, so um, we will at this time bid each and all good night. Thank you for being on our call. Special thanks to our visitors for joining us on our Bible classes. And we meet again for our worship service on Sunday at 9 a.m. promptly. Thanks everyone for being on. Have a good night and um, a great rest of, rest of the week. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. I have a question. The Sunday school classes are also recorded. Yes, yes, they're also recorded as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.